Hello and a very warm welcome to this very special edition of the Brandsy Top 100 Most Valuable Global Brands 2019 Web Seminar. My name's David Roth from WPP here in Beijing and it's my pleasure to take you through today's broadcast. We've got a very special edition including the announcement of a new number one brand in the Brandsy rankings for 2019. But before we announce that, let's take a look at what we're going to cover on today's programme. In today's web seminar, we're going to explain how the rankings are calculated, unveil the top 100 most valuable global brands for 2019, including revealing the new number one. Introduce you to our new AI team member, Rosie. Hear from the higher president and CEO, one of our new entrant brands, and from global retail leaders around the world. And also from the Prime Minister of the Netherlands. Get the thoughts of key Kantar experts as we share insights from this year's study. And a lot, lot more. So hold on tight, relax, and enjoy as we start from our studio. The Brandsy Top 100 Most Valuable Global Brands for 2019 Web Seminar. Well, as you can see, we've got a lot to cover in a very short period of time. Welcome to our studio here and our first guest for the Brandsy Top 100 Most Valuable Global Brands 2019 web seminar brought to you by WPP is Elsbeth Chung and Elsbeth is the director of valuations uh, globally for uh, Brand Z and also for Cantor. Very warm welcome Elsbeth, thanks very much indeed for joining us. Thank you David. You've had a very busy year. Well very very busy, yeah. Um, we started doing, or we started, you started doing uh, brand valuations just looking at uh, global brands, we then extended that to uh, Chinese brands, then to Indian brands. This year, how many brand rankings are we going to be doing over the course of the year? We're talking about 18 rankings, and we are introducing two new rankings this year, Japan and Canada. So wh when are Japan, Japan and Canada coming out? Slightly later on in later the year, year and we'll right. give you information about when that's going to happen. Right. Um, every single one of those rankings um, is done to exactly the same methodology. Right. Uh, and I think it's probably fair for us, uh, as we do every year, um, it's become a bit of a, a tradition to yep. start off <laughs> right. uh, with a methodology because, in right. a sense, that's the root uh, to everything. So perhaps yep. you can explain to us, first of all, a little bit about the Brand Z data set. Yeah, of course, David. Um, you were mentioning about all the, the collection of our Brand Z brand value rankings. And a lot of times when people f uh, think about Brand Z, it is um, brand value rankings. But in fact, Brand Z is the largest brand equity platform in the world. So since more than 20 years ago, we have been talking to millions of consumers in more than 50 markets around the world about their perception of brands. And to date, we have cumulate, accumulated more than 5.2 billion of data points. So brand C is true big data in the world of marketing. So all those sort of 5.2 billion uh, data points now with the tools that Kantar has to manage and clean insights and data mine from uh, those uh, massive great big big data sets now is, is, is also providing a whole new level of insights within uh, the brand Z data set as well. Right, definitely. Now, um, when it comes to valuations, um, I think uh, a lot of people um, would like to understand a little bit more about how the valuation process is done. Yeah. But before that, I suppose there's, you know, where the rubber meets the road. And in this instance, is it actually yeah. does having a strong brand, a valuable brand, uh, generate uh, superior economics and better value right. for shareholders? This is, a, in fact, a very important valid, validation point that we have uh, since 14 years ago when we first launched our, 2000, first launched our um, global ranking in 2006. So we have been tracking the share price performance of the most powerful brands in our brand C portfolios. And what we find is the share price performance of the most powerful brands that we have every year in the last 14 years outperformed 
S&P 500 by two and a half times, and they also outperformed the MSCI World Index by a staggering five times. So again and again, we try to prove that brand building marketing is not a cost. It is a long-term investment that can give us shareholders return. So that's a graph that you see on your screen. Um, exactly. That's definitely worth showing the, uh, both yeah. the finance director uh, and the chairman and the city analysts right. uh, as well. Now, in order to get that, you have to do a lot of work yep. um, in order to look at the most valuable brands, which yep. you've done. Um, how does that process work in order to actually arrive at the brand value? Yeah, so there are two main ingredients in our brand valuation formula. Number one, financial valued. So that is the dollar value that is attributable by a brand to the company who owns it. So second of all is brand contribution. So it measures the proportion of financial value that is derived from a brand's ability to do two things. Number one, to increase purchase volume, and number two, to charge volume. So these two together will form what we call the brand valued, and this is how we rank our brands in any brand C rankings. And this is quite important because um, brand C is the best brand value ranking in the market because we rely solely on consumer data point in our valuation. It is important because consumers like you and me, David, we pay for brands every day. So our viewpoints are actually very crucial to look at when we are trying to when we are trying to arrive at the brand valued. So Elspeth, when you've looked at uh, all the brands in your analysis of the brands that uh, this year have uh, grown their brand value more than others, what are the common features of the brands that have grown their equity more than the average? Definitely. So from the 14 years of our brand history, what we see is we try to find a the very important uh, ingredient to grow the brand value. And what we see is the brands which are seen as the most powerful, meaning that the ones which have the strongest brand equity have grown their brand values 3.5 times faster than the ones which are seen as least powerful. So in fact, brand equity is key to building brand value. And we'll be talking a little bit about uh, how to grow brand equity a little bit later on, but for the moment, Elder Chang, the uh, Global Valuations Director for Brandsy and Cantor. Thank you very much, Steve, for joining us. Thank you, David. Well, a very warm welcome, Graham Stablehurst, to our studio. Graham is the uh, Strategy Director for Brandsy and uh, at uh, Cantor. Graham, uh, very warm welcome. Thank you. It's the first time you made an appearance uh, on our Brandsy broadcasts. Um, what news do you bring us? What's the big sort of helicopter themes from the Brandsy Top 100 Most Valuable Global Brands for 2019? Um, uh, well, yes, it is a, a new job for me. And um, the news that I bring is it's a year of change. Um, there's a lot of movement in the ranking this year, a lot of volatility. Um, and uh, it reflects the volatility of the world around us. So uh, we see uh, many changes happening in the world, whether they're driven by technology, by society, by politics, uh, by environmental concerns. All of these factors are also being reflected in the world of brands. Now, you've uh, created a new term. Explain a little bit about what it is. It's on the screen. I've, I've what? stolen what the term. What is it? I've stolen the mean? term. Yeah, this uh, phrase, VUCA, was uh, coined by um, the think tanks uh, in the American Defense Department at the end of the Cold War. Uh, up until then, their lives had been very easy, very black and white. Um, we're the good guys. We've got a, you know, a, a known opponent. Um, Life was easy. Life was and, simple. Then, and, and they could plan for that. Um, and, and you know, they would do their war games and all the rest of it on that basis. After the wall came down, uh, perestroika, uh, the um, uh, devolution of the, the USSR, um, they saw that the world had become uh, uh, VUCA, as we say here. And um, that stands for four things. So volatile. So things were changing at a much faster rate than they had done before. They were uncertain. They weren't able to predict what was going to happen next in the world, whether, you know, for the Defense Department, where the next threat would come from. But we can think about that in our own world as well. You know, sort of what's the next thing we're going to discover, you know, is bad for our health or is going to affect the planet. Um, 
it was more complex. It's not just a bipolar world anymore, um, very complex, and it was ambiguous. It was very hard to define uh, exactly what constituted a threat anymore. So, so how does that manifest itself in today's brand world and the insights that you've derived from this year's analysis? Yeah. Um, well, I think VUCA is a term that's being used actually a lot in management now as well to try and capture how to manage a business. And I think it really does apply to marketers as well. So the first point, the volatility, it's really well illustrated by the degree of movement that we're seeing in our uh, Brand Z Top 100 rankings this year. We've got a new number one to reveal. Um, we've got nine new brands coming in, which is more than the we've seen in the last few years. And we've got more brands going up or down by substantial amounts of value due to all these forces affecting us. So that's the uncertainty in the world. Things like Brexit, things like the US-China uh, trade disputes, um, and many other factors um, that we could not have, have necessarily known were going to uh, come and impinge on uh, the marketing world. Um, it's also a more complicated world. Now, we've talked at Brand Z before about the evolution of brands from single category entities like a Ford or a Coca-Cola into much more complex ecosystems. And uh, brands are now operating or having to cooperate across multiple categories. And it's getting much more complicated to to manage brands, if it indeed is. in this world you, you, you yeah. have the capacity to manage it, because those brands are very much seen as owned by the consumers, and the consumers are managing those exactly, brands. Exactly, exactly. We've got more stakeholders, uh, we've got more media channels, we've got more routes to consumer to deliver our product or our service. So yeah, and, and that leads on to the final point, the ambiguity of who on earth are we actually competing with anyway? If I'm McDonald's, um, you know, do I collaborate or do I compete with uh, food delivery companies? If I'm Amazon, um, you know, sort of, am I am I a, a retailer or am I a, an entertainment provider or am I going to grow into a B two B company? So all of these blurring of boundaries, competition coming from new places, the disruption that we see in the world um, adds up to this this concept of VUCA. Well, all that makes things much more complex, but actually doesn't change the fundamentals, which is being able to manage all of that, being able to create, uh, grow, maintain strong brands is going to become more and more important, more vital to organizations in, a, in, in this world that you're it, it portraying. It does. And one of my colleagues said, you know, there was a prediction that the internet would kill brands. Um, actually, no. Yes, it's provided lots of opportunities for brands, but we have to remember, brands are shortcuts that consumers use to make sense of this complex world around them, so they become even more important when that world is more uncertain and ambiguous and complex. So brands are really important, and to businesses, information is really important. Information is the one way that you can cut through um, the complexity, the ambiguity, and the uncertainty. If you know more about that world, about your brand and how it operates, what makes it tick, how to grow it, then that puts you in a much better place to manage your, your business. Well, course, we'll be revealing some of those insights a little bit uh, later. Um, you talked about volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity, and how all of those in one form or another are reflected in the changes that we are seeing in the 2019 uh, brand valuation ranking. So I think now is the time uh, to reveal the Brandy Top 100 Most Valuable Global Brands for 2019. And as you alluded to, uh, we do have a new number one, so take a look at this.
Well, a massive congratulations. What do you think of that? Amazon now the brand's the top 100 most valuable global brand for 2019. And also a massive congratulations to every single brand in the top 100. It's an amazing achievement. And to discuss that with us, I'm delighted to be joined by uh, my friend and partner on the Brand Z uh, project, um, Dorian Wang, who is the global Brand Z director at uh, Cantar. Dorian, always a pleasure. Thank you very much indeed for joining us here in the studio. A very exciting day and now a very Absolutely. exciting moment. We have revealed who is the Brand Z Top 100 Most Valuable Global Brand. Yeah, Thank you very much, David, for having me and congratulations to all the Top 100 Brands. Do you know that every year we research and value the 160,000 brands? So winning any award out of the 160,000 brands is statistically more difficult than winning the Academy Award. Well, that's so pretty impressive. Yes. Congratulations for winning the Oscar of Marketing. Uh, the total value of uh, the 2019 Top 100 Most Valuable Brands has reached $4.7 trillion. The number looks big. The number is actually it very is big. big. <laughs> it is equals to three countries' GDP. David, can you guess which three countries? Well, probably sort of Sweden and maybe, <laughs> uh, I don't know, Italy. Yeah. Bigger than that. Bigger than that. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, so, so three countries are Spain, South Korea that's, that's and nothing, Russia. Wow, that's nothing against Sweden, by the way. I'm not trying to upset <laughs> anyone from Sweden. Yeah, it's uh, the 100 brands the total value equals to three very, very leading countries' GDP combined. That's pretty impressive. Let's take a little, little look, Doreen, at just, I suppose, the rate of growth over the course of the years that we've now been valuing uh, the global top 100. What do we see in, in terms of this year? How does that fare with other years in the past? Yeah, the growth rate over the past one year is 7%, which is in line with the past 13 years uh, average growth rate. 7% is still doubling uh, the global well, GDP that's, average. That's, that's pretty good because actually yes. glo glo global GDP is what, 2 and a half, 3 maybe 4% depending on yes. which, which numbers you look at. Yes, which actually give us an implication. No matter how uncertain, how volatile uh, the market can be, and uh, the brand growth momentum never slow down. So brand investment is still the most important investment any company should do to ensure long-term and sustainable financial success. Now, the big news, of course, um, at least in the top 10, uh, is uh, the new number one. So let's just take a little look at that Amazon. Yes, and we are very excited. We have a new number one uh, in 2019, and it's Amazon. Amazon's total brand value is $315 billion, which equals to the country GDP of Philippines. Amazon's brand value is a country uh, GDP. Um, and, and, and I suppose the the significance of that is not so much in that big number, which is unbelievably That's impressive, true. but is over the period of time and who they've been battling with in order to now become the number one brand. Let's travel back the time machine. 2007, the number one was Microsoft. And then uh, in the next 12 years, it was a competition between Google and Apple and replacing for number one only five years ago, Apple's brand value was six times bigger than Amazon. And how could Amazon grow from um, just a couple of billion dollars brand value and all the way to 300 billion within the last decade? Well, it's sort of more, even more amazing than that, actually. How can somebody go from selling a few books yeah. on a rather dodgy internet site? <laughs> yeah, we would never expect <laughs> to, to in, where, in 1994 you know, to, to and Amazon could be the, the number one. And, uh, there are two lessons we can learn from Amazon. Number one is Amazon is not just a single brand. It's not a bookseller anymore. It's not just e-commerce. It is building its own ecosystem, Amazon TV, Prime, and, uh, and Echo. Wherever consumers are, Amazon provides services and products to the consumers. And do you know that right now Amazon is providing services to in over 15 categories? And number two, all the brands can learn from Amazon's speed. It's not just a concept. It's not just an eco-platform concept. Right now, it's, it's not, Amazon can put it into execution. Yeah, it's not just a word on a PowerPoint chart either, is it? No, yeah. no. And uh, they, they really expanded. And, uh, and they are anticipating and consumers' needs and meeting it in a speedy way. Um, on that chart, you can see we have a brand equity score of 144. Mm. 
What does that mean, and is that 144 good? That means the average of the top 100 is 100. That means Amazon's brand equity is 44% higher than the global top 100 average. And just five years ago, that number was 112. So Amazon has grown massively and, and, on its brand and how, equity. How difficult is it to drive? I mean, that's a key metric. How difficult is it to drive that score up at that, at that type of level? It's not an easy task. Brand is not going to be built overnight. And, uh, and for Amazon's case and many, many other successful brands' case, and we have to accumulate the brand equity day after day, year after year. But the most important thing is we need to build the meaningful uh, relevance and with the consumers and build new meanings to consumers and bring new meanings into consumers' lives. Now, um, if we take a look at the top 10, most valuable brands for 2019. What do we see there? Interesting, interesting goings on. <laughs> the top 10 are not just American brands yeah. anymore. <laughs> uh, we have eight American brands and we have two Chinese brands among the top 10. Um, and this year, Microsoft, Visa, and, and, and uh, Alibaba all have achieved a double digit brand value growth. And it's definitely worth mentioning the two Chinese brands. Well, let's uh, talk Alibaba about those because Ali, you know, Alibaba um, only a few weeks ago, we launched the Brandsy Top 100 Most Valuable yeah. Chinese Brands. And for the first time, Alibaba was the number one most valuable Chinese brand. So, so, so what do we see there? Yeah, we are seeing that um, Alibaba took over the number one place. And similar as global, we have a new number one Chinese brand as well. And Alibaba and Tencent are both massive ecosystem brands in China. It's not just providing one or two products. It is building the ecosystem surrounding consumers' life, social commerce, uh, online, offline, seamless integration, and food delivery, and gaming, so everything. Wherever your imagination are, and these brands are expanding their services surrounding you. Um, I think Alibaba and Tencent, their expansion of the ecosystem, the speed is nothing shy from Amazon. And of course, they, I mean, particularly Alibaba is moving not just uh, from uh, virtual retail, but also very heavily into physical retail. In fact, they did that long before Amazon. Yeah. I went into the you physical did space. There's, yes, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I spent a lot of money there. <laughs> yes, you can got the fish yes, right yeah, out of yeah. the tank. Well, yeah. it was that Jack Marsh shot. I had to, <laughs> I, I, I had to have that. Um, at the moment, it's, I think, impossible to look at a chart that has a number of American brands and a number of Chinese brands without mentioning uh, the US-China trade negotiations, trade wars, depending on which side of the, uh, the fence you are at the moment. Yeah. What impact do you think that's having uh, with China's Chinese brands? Yeah, actually, David, we, we, have the, uh, uh, we have the opportunity to talk with both American CEOs and Chinese CEOs, and, uh, and uh, a lot of them uh, shared their perspective with us. As we know that the Chinese brands are very ambitious, going global. And they're not just looking at the US market. They are looking at around the world like UK and the European market and South, uh, South America market and Middle East and Africa market, these are all equally important. So they want to understand the local needs and build their brands there. In the meantime, the American brands have been deeply embedded in Chinese consumers' life, and they want to continue to build that bonding with the Chinese consumers. So for them is, how can I further localize? How can I better meet consumers' needs? So I think um, US and China, the trade the negotiation, actually bring a lot of opportunities and to, for brands to look beyond these two countries. There are a lot of massive rest of the world. Yes, and, which, and, and, <laughs> you know, it could well be a great unintended consequence of the US, of yeah. people actually in China thinking, well, actually, maybe my focus should not be the US and, and uh, indeed the rest of the and world. Just, just an example, UK brands and being perceived really uh, unique and, uh, and uh, um, trustworthy in Chinese consumers' mind. And maybe that's a great opportunity for UK and European brands to keep expanding the consumer base. Now, history is a wonderful thing. We've now got uh, a number of years of history of the uh, Brandsy Global Rankings. When you look at uh, the top 10 most valuable global brands when we started in 2009 versus where we are uh, 2019. 
Yep. What does history tell us? And history tells us what does a it tell great us about story. Yeah, well? <laughs> tells us a great story. And the 10 years, the top 10 brand value has tripled. And so that was a massive, massive growth. And the four brands were still there. And we, we can look at the charts and we don't know, we don't need to mention who they are. But those six brands have been replaced by more mobile and the tech enabled retail finance brands. And we have to admit that they are still very, very strong brands uh, like GE, like Coca-Cola. They are still very, very strong brands. They are building their own ecosystem around their core product and services. But in the meantime, um, we are seeing the mobile, the, the e-commerce and brands are catching up in the, in the, in the same time. So, the next 10 years are going to be more exciting and, and uh, we are going to embrace more changes. Now, we've talked a little bit about uh, ecosystem brands, so maybe we could just sort of conclude. Yeah. Um, you know, I suppose if you took a helicopter view historically, you know, first of all came sort of what we would now call product brands. Yeah. I think after that, you'd probably say there was the era of uh, the, the corporate brand becoming more important. Then latterly, as we've seen and the growth of the last few years of, uh, I suppose, the, more, the platform brands. Uh, we're talking about, we believe that there's this next genre of mm. ecosystem brands. What do you think the difference between an ecosystem brand and a platform brand is? Yeah, well, um, this is my definition. And may not, you know, my understanding through working with them is, I think the ecosystem brands, they always have a core product and services at the beginning, but they keep expanding and, uh, and uh, wherever consumers' needs are, are expanding and they are always there. And for example, like Hire, uh, who is our newcomer uh, this year, uh, which, is, which, which is the number one home appliance brand worldwide. It, it's a washing machine and a refrigerator are all the best seller around the world. But in the meantime, through merger and acquisition and through self-expanding, and Hire has successfully transformed itself from just a home appliance brand and right now to an IoT ecosystem brand and the connecting consumers' lives, like if like in logistics and in uh, product delivery and in um, um, smart uh, air conditioner. So these areas are higher are expanding and but, become but, but I think, but service I think that, and, yeah. But I think that the thing that to me differentiates that high, mm. this new hire model mm. from other is just that the, 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 the way in which the consumer is in the absolute center of that ecosystem. Yep. And that ecosystem is being around what's being best for the consumer and what's best to drive lifetime uh, value. Yes, so that's what uh, a key conclusion we have drawn is no matter how volatile and how uncertain the environment might be, consumer-centric, technology-enabled, are very, very important to be successful in the next decade. Doreen, always a pleasure. Sweet to be later on. Thanks very much indeed. Thank you very much, David. Glamour. Star power. Fame. Influence. Introducing Celebrity Z, a potent fusion of global A-listers, social influencers, and brand Z data, all brought to you in collaboration with Spotted, the world's richest celebrity database. For fast and analytic evaluation of the best fit between celebrity and brand, go to Celebrity Z. Available now and exclusive to WPP, a Brand Z and Spotted production. Well, I'm delighted now to be joined in our studio by Eric Heller. Eric, uh, great pleasure to have you with us. Uh, Eric is the founder of Marketplace Ignition, which was a company that WPP acquired a couple of years ago and is now the Chief Knowledge Officer um, of uh, the WPP Amazon Center of Excellence. And of course, you're also a former Amazon employee. So um, 
you can help us out on a number of different dimensions here, Eric. Um, a new number one brand, it's Amazon. Does that shock you? Uh, they've only been working at it for about 20 years. You know, there's this great um, story about uh, when you look at uh, when you look at their annual letter to shareholders, what's fascinating about this and about Amazon is that every year they send that same, they include the original letter to shareholders from 1997. And what's amazing is it's one of the only companies I can recall that does anything like this. But if you read it today, it still fits the model they're doing. And, you know, they make this great comment in there where they say, at every point, where we have an opportunity to go for short-term gain or long-term shareholder value, we'll make the choice for long-term shareholder value. So it's clear they've been doing, they've been working at growing this in an, in an incredibly long time, since 1997. How, I mean, when you were there, um, how brand-centric is the company? Uh, uh, in terms of the Amazon brand? Yes, yeah. I think that's a great question, right? The Amazon brand, is almost secondary to the fact that, that it was start with the customer and work backwards. In other words, if you take care of the customer, the brand will grow. And I think that they also are very keenly aware of the other things that build the affinity for the brand, whether it's Amazon Prime, whether it's two day or one day. You know, we used to have this program called Surprise and Delight. And the idea was that if people are consistently surprised and delighted, we, things arrive faster than normal, they ship faster than normal, the product I was really looking for was there, all of those things create and drive the flywheel, which drives revenue, which drives the brand. How uh, surprised uh, are you that uh, it's taken Amazon a relatively long period of time to become the world's most valuable brand? And for the past, I don't know, four or five years, the battle has been between um, sort of Google uh, and Apple. Uh, you know, um, I, I guess I'm not surprised that it's taken a long time, but I think it's a case of consistent of the waterfall wearing down the, the rock. You know, the water that continuously drips and wears a path in the rock. I think, you know, when you think about, um, when you think about uh, how there was this, there was them um, early on in the early days, people couldn't believe that Amazon didn't charge for reviews and ratings. No one was giving them away. And Jeff made this comment at the time where he said, look, and he was quoted as saying, We're, if, if you become the central place where everyone reads reviews and ratings for a thing, eventually they'll buy something when they come to read those. And in some ways it's that same, that you know, you'll notice actually with this story and the, and the last one, the, I keep using the word eventually. They've been working at this for so long and just continuously at each point, making decisions on optimizing shareholder value or optimizing customer experience, and then using that to grow perception of the brand. And by as perception grows, people keep coming back. Now, one of the things that we've talked about, um, and I think we'll be talking about um, for the rest of, uh, of this web seminar, is the importance of experience now. Um, how important to Amazon is the, the end user experience? Oh, I think, I think uh, it's the penultimate thing to them. In other words, creating a strong and valuable experience and continuously, um, and continuously driving that is how, how they believe they'll create affinity and then long-term shareholder value. If you think about, um, if you think about uh, all of the things that they've done where they're creating this sort of ecosystem, this thing that we see a lot of the tech giants doing, but what Amazon does is I, I get my Prime Video and I have my Alexa playing my music and I have my, my pro I have a package on the door with an Amazon branded thing every single day. Each of those things I think is creating an ecosystem of experience. And that ecosystem of experience almost becomes in front of the ecosystem or perception of the brands I bought or the thing I bought. Now, it's taken Amazon a reasonable amount of time, but it's unbelievably impressive. So in essence, it's a very short amount of time uh, to go from the proverbial sort of selling books on a relatively dodgy uh, website to uh, being the world's most uh, valuable brand. What challenges do you see for Amazon in the future in maintaining that position? Uh, one, of course, is the question of saturation. Um, there is a perception, I think, uh, right or wrong, that Amazon you know, already has all the prime members they're going to get. 
I think there's some great data from Kantar that demonstrates it takes three years to saturate uh, a prime member. So in other words, once someone be joins the program, it takes them three years to fully uh, change their behavior. But I think there's more than that. I think, you know, David, um, in your travels, I've heard you talk about the growth of Alibaba. I've heard you talk about all of these other markets and e-commerce e that you see in different regions. And I think we can all look at this and say, e-commerce in the U.S. alone is still only 10% of commerce. There is so much uh, growth left for e-commerce, for pervasiveness in healthcare, in um, B2B. I don't think we're talking nearly enough about how e-commerce is, is probably five to 10 years behind where it could be in B2B. There are so many areas of growth still that I think that the future, I think that there is an unlimited amount of future potential. And does Amazon have the potential to get as big as Alibaba is in their home market? Maybe not because they, there's some potential government restrictions that we don't see in China that I think you'll see sure. in the US and elsewhere and governmental, regulatory. But could they get a lot bigger? Absolutely. One of the things that's always impressed me uh, about Amazon is uh, their ability to make a massive great big bet in something that seems a long way off. Um, is that a characteristic of the organization? Do you think that's something that uh, will outlive Jeff Bezos being in control of the, of the beast? Gosh, that's a great question. Um, I think they're very metric focused. Um, you know, they make bold bets. Um, but are, are those bets data driven or is somebody taking a punt? <laughs> that's a great question. I think it's both. I think that they're not afraid to make bold bets. You know, they talk about, you know, the age old fail fast, um, but learn. Uh, they're, um, you know, as someone who was there very early on, I saw a lot of these. You know, they worked at grocery for a very long time before they became relevant. Um, frankly, we all today take for granted the fact that you get on a plane and a third of the people seem to have Kindles. But I can remember the original discussion in like 2001 with whether or not it's a good idea to be part of Kindle. And there was a chance I was going to go work on the team. And I'll tell you, I was a little nervous about tying my, you know, what, as they say, hitching my proverbial carriage to that horse because it didn't seem like anyone was going to read a book on a 14 or 17 pound uh, computer monitor. But they were making an eight year out bet that they could redesign the hardware, come up with a, that people would buy eBooks. And I think that's part of the DNA of the organization. And I also think that they have a lot of latitude by their shareholders that other companies don't get to make these long-term bets. People believe that they're, that they're gonna work out. So even when a bet doesn't work out, the market in many ways ignores it. The Fire Phone is an example or plenty of other things. You know, um, uh, the dash buttons. You know, the dash button may not have worked out as a physical thing, but is auto replenishment going to turn into something? Sure. Boy, that was an amazing idea. Now, given how fast Amazon has grown, um, it clearly is uh, a massive marketplace for a lot of brands and actually a lot of WPP uh, uh, clients in one form or another. What is WPP doing in order to, to help our clients and potential clients? Uh, navigate their way through Amazon to make Amazon as efficient and as an effective tool it can be to drive their business? You know, you, uh, I'm glad that you asked that. The, the short answer is that we're creating a new approach. Uh, the traditional approach of thinking about creative when you launch a brand as a supplement um, to go to market and then, the, and then the retailer really takes that product to market and puts it in front of uh, and puts that product in front of a customer. With Amazon, everything is integrated and it requires a different approach. Even if I have great creative, none of that will show if the product is out of stock because it won't, it won't show up in search. That integrated idea, and even then, we have data that demonstrates that 90% of shoppers, regardless of venue, so even if they're in brick and mortar, say they check reviews and ratings on Amazon before they make a purchase. So that changes the dynamic. How do I think about Amazon? How do I think about my investment there? What is the value of a dollar on Amazon in terms of whether or not shot someone is making a purchase in brick and mortar? So what we're doing is we're reconfiguring all of that analysis and all of that know-how and work 
to then go and be integrated across WPP. So we have a team, uh, we're creating something called the Amazon Center of Excellence, or sorry, the Center of Excellence for Amazon, ACE. And what it does is it pervasively takes 150 to 200 experts, both in the US and in Europe. And we are pervading that throughout the WPP e infrastructure. So if you are already working with the team or you are already working across WPP, that team can instantly inject experts from that team directly into the workflows that you have to make them Amazon aware. And then finally, to make your program Amazon smart. And really, when you think about it, I like to say there's no brand that doesn't need an Amazon strategy. And so the question is, now that we know that, I'm even including um, media, including automotive, you think of all of these big programs, then what we call non-endemic, and you think, well, what's their TV strategy? Amazon's um, showing fo American football games in the United States. What's the TV strategy to make sure we own that experience? You think about, well, um, a week ago, uh, I, the treasure truck took over Piedmont Park in Atlanta, where I live, and the treasure truck had this thing called Pup Fest, and they pervasively um, uh, advertised it across all radio, all across the Atlanta. And the people came from all over Atlanta and their dogs got a free shave. And then there was a, it was a great venue for companies like Hills to show um, Science Diet their dog food. And there was this just this amazing sort of physical experience, which isn't something we think about Amazon at all. And there was a way to sample product, see product, and then you could sign up for a subscribe and save. It's such an amazing example of really, I think that the book is, we're, we're, we're not even at, we're not even on chapter one. We're on like chap like five pages into chapter one where I think this can go. Or as Jeff says, it's still day one. Well, still day one. Um, Eric, thank you very much indeed. If anybody wants to get hold of Eric and understand more about the uh, Amazon Center of Excellence, just contact him on the uh, email address that's on your screen now. Eric Heller, thank you very much indeed for joining us. Thank you, David. It was a pleasure. Well, it's always nice to see you, Martin. Martin Guerrero, the yeah. research director for Brandsy and Cantar. Warm welcome to the studio. You've had a, also had a, a busy uh, few months. Absolutely. Uh, <laughs> that time of year. Um, we're going to talk uh, about the newcomers to mm. the 2019 Brandsy Global Rankings. Newcomers, again, is one of those really interesting categories to do a little bit of a deep dive in because it, uh, it's very interesting to see what it is that uh, makes a brand uh, hit the rankings uh, many of these uh, for the first time. So first of all, helicopter view, do we have any newcomers? Yes, we have nine. Um, so I think as we said already, it's been a very volatile year, a volatile landscape. Um, so having nine newcomers to the top 100 is a bit of an exception. So higher than our usual average of around six or seven brands. Um, so yeah, it's, I think the top 100 itself is reacting is to the volatile thing? world. Is, 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 um, what what, what yeah. would you say that, that represents in a sense? Yeah, I think so. I think it represents, it represents change. And I think we're seeing that brands that are best able to adapt to this world of big data, use data intelligently, are the ones that are winning. The brands that are true to their purpose um, are really shining through and breaking into that top 100. And this year, in terms of the newcomers, we're seeing them also from different geographies around yeah. the world. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, we've got nine, as we said, um, there's been a tech focus, but we're still seeing that um, new Chinese brands are dominating. So four of the nine are actually from China. Um, so we've got uh, Meituan, Didi Chuxing, um, Haya, and uh, also um, Xiaomi is okay. the fourth. Well, let's, let's uh, look at a couple of those sure. uh, Chinese brands in detail. Let's look yes. at uh, Xiaomi, first of all. Yeah. Um, for those of you who might not know Xiaomi, um, it's a, a massive, mobile phone business does lots more of uh, consumer technology it's sometimes referred to as the apple of china maybe rightly maybe wrongly um, and i think they are now the market leader in india yeah absolutely so an interesting story so the me actually stands for mobile internet so they started with uh, mobile phone handsets and their business model was genuinely disruptive so they tend to leave their handsets in market for longer um, meaning that then they have an advantage in terms of the price of component parts and they pass that on to the consumer so actually um, relatively speaking as a consumer particularly in Asia, it's easy to get hold of a pretty high-spec handset 
um, for a relatively much lower price than the likes of iPhone, the likes of Samsung. So that's certainly fed their growth. And now the business has taken that massive success in mobile and are starting to spread into other categories and other markets, so featuring in Europe as well. But they've clearly built their own ecosystem. They've tapped into the Internet of Things, and you can almost have a completely Xiaomi home, particularly in, in Asia for the time being. And indeed, they're even opening their own uh, retail stores, uh, a number in China, a number in yeah, some of exactly. the European countries uh, as well. Exactly. What do we see from a brand perspective, um, from the brandy data that we have in terms of, you know, it once was a China-only brand, now it's moving into other geographies? Yeah, well, like I said, they're moving into Europe. Um, they're also moving into other parts of Asia, so South Korea, Malaysia, India, um, but also Russia. So they've taken that core strength in China and have clearly taken some of those same principles, those same uh, vision, the same vision, the same purpose, um, and are applying that very successfully in other markets. Uh, and, and they're building uniqueness, and I suppose one of our brands he measures in terms of power, we're seeing that that power is being uh, reflected in the other markets as well. Yeah, exactly. So there's, there's that clear building equity, that clear building consumer preference. And particularly in China, there are other brands uh, at play within the same sphere. Um, but I think the strength that Xiaomi is seeing in other markets globally is that perhaps some of those Chinese competitors are not as on the front foot as they've been in globalizing their brand. So for the time being, they've got some of those markets, not quite to themselves, but they're reaping that advantage of, of being the first mover, essentially. OK, let's uh, take a look at another one of those uh, new entry yeah. brands from China, uh, Hire. Yeah, Hire is another interesting one. So, um, yeah, a hugely successful year, clearly a brand on the rise. And again, um, they're a brand that is clearly tip tapping into the Internet of Things phenomenon. And, and um, it's an interesting brand, for, again, for those people that don't know Hire very well, uh, they are the world's leader in domestic appliances. They're buying yep. a whole series of businesses around the world. They bought a few years ago all of uh, GE's um, domestic appliance business in the States. Yeah. They've just bought candy in Italy. Mm -hmm. uh, they're a, a brand on the move. Absolutely. So I mean, their tactics are clear. It's about connecting the home. Um, it's about tapping into the Internet of Things and really bringing benefits to the consumers in, in that regard. And they're a brand that has definitely done that very successfully. And clearly, similar to Xiaomi, it's a brand with global ambition. And I'm sure we'll continue to see them go from strength to strength. But it's also a brand that's sort of uh, viewing the world in a very different way. Way, redefining their business model, looking at it much more of a of a, uh, a, a platform uh, a brand, uh, an IoT ecosystem brand, yeah. than just a purely a, uh, a brand for uh, domestic appliances. Yeah, absolutely. And I think again, it shows the the relevance of being data savvy in any sphere now. So, I mean, who would have thought a few years ago that your fridge is able to understand you and understand your needs? But um, you know, by understanding all of the data that they're fed from around the home, I think that's going to take the brand to the next level. And uh, we will be hearing from uh, the uh, chief of executive of Hire in, uh, a little bit later in this broadcast to a little bit understand a little bit more about actually what is uh, their business model uh, and how they see uh, the world uh, and their brand going forward in the future. Sure. Um, let's uh, take a look at Chanel, a brand mm. that uh, uh, might be a newcomer in the top 100, but it is certainly not uh, a newcomer on the on the uh, global brand scene. Yeah, no, not at all. I mean, luxury brands have had a very successful year as a collective. Um, so the fastest growing category that we've had this year is luxury brands, and Chanel has been a driver of that. Um, I mean, obviously, unfortunately, um, it was the year we lost Karl Lagerfeld, um, one of their key design team, but he'd left the brand in a very strong position. I mean, they're seen compared to their competitors as extremely desirable, very sexy, very innovative. Um, their shows uh, are, are world famous. Um, they, they deliver brand experience fantastically well and real events. I, I think it's worth just mentioning um, those dimensions you've talked about, you know, innovative, desirable, sexy. They're measures that we have in the brands e data that everybody can get access to. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and those perceptions of innovation are key. And I think, again, it's a good example of a brand uh, that's operating in a category that may not, to the, um, to the layperson, be particularly innovative or possible to achieve high levels of perceptions of innovation. But I think they're an example of a brand that have very successfully done that within the world of fashion. But yeah, as you say, we can do that in any, any category. Um, I think it's fair to say, isn't it, that uh, getting into 
the top 100 is becoming more and more difficult year by year. Yeah, absolutely. So if we look back to 2006, I think the 100th ranked brand was worth around $4 billion. Um, this year, Adidas is our number 100 for the second year in a row, um, but Adidas's value is around $13.5 billion. So um, the bar uh, is being raised all the time, and we've practically tripled, more than tripled, um, the minimum 100 brands, uh, you know, the lower value. So it's harder and harder, as you say. So, so, so what does that mean in terms of what one needs to do in order to establish you know, a very valuable brand. Yeah, well, I think we've seen with some of our um, some of the brands that have fallen from the ranking this year, it's not necessarily that they've had bad years. They're still growing, um, but they're just not growing fast enough. So it's about continuing to innovate, continue to look for ways in which your brand can perhaps operate with new partners, within new categories, um, to continue to, to drive value for your business. Now, we've looked at um, what are the attributes of brands that have been successful, yep. that are growing. What are the attributes of the brands that have, for whatever reasons, fallen out of the rankings? Yeah, that's interesting. So um, we touched on earlier the fact that salience uh, is generally a strength across the whole of the top 100. So clearly, by definition almost, these, are a, uh, these 100 brands are very well known um, to consumers. But salience alone certainly is not enough to sustain your brand in the long term. So we're seeing brands that have managed to increase their meaningful difference, um, their understanding of consumer needs. Um, they, those are the brands that are growing and brands that are being um, eroded in that space or perhaps overtaken by competitors, those that are standing still in terms of their meaningful difference to consumers, those are the brands that are actually showing a flattening of value or even declines in some places. OK, now let's um, take a look at uh, a couple of examples. The first, uh, Facebook. Yeah, Facebook's an interesting one because um, it's the first year we've seen a decline in their brand value. But if we look back at the data, some of the signs were there. So we can see here that their meaningful difference over time relative to their competitors has been on the slide. Um, so it's not a huge surprise that we're finally seeing brand value decline. But it's not all bad news for Facebook. Instagram's our fastest riser this yeah. year, clearly owned by Facebook. Um, and maybe there's a, a hint there that perhaps what Facebook may um, do in future, which they've been rumoured to do for a while, is look for a single platform, maybe bringing together the Facebook platform with Instagram, maybe even WhatsApp in future. So watch the space and let's, let's see where they go from here. A, a little bit uh, like following the Chinese we, uh, WeChat model. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> OK, Netflix, probably the uh, other side of that particular coin at the moment. Yeah, absolutely. So almost the corollary of that. So Netflix um, has been a brand that has its meaningful difference has gone from strength to strength. So clearly defined a completely new way to consume media, to consume content, very much investing in the content itself now to differentiate themselves from the likes of Prime and from Disney's offer, which is coming later this year, and from Apple TV as well. But as we've seen their meaningful difference increase, and obviously we've seen their brand value increase. So again, another of our fastest rises this year. And uh, finally, let's take a look at MasterCard. Yeah, MasterCard's an interesting one. So um, we haven't had uh, many new entries to the top 10 for a while. But from looking at the data, MasterCard seems like it could be the next cab off the rank in that regard. Um, so their meaningful difference to consumers versus their competitors has been steadily increasing I mean, for a long time now. that's quite interesting things to look at, actually, is those yeah. brands that, that, uh, that are going to make it into the top 10. Yeah, so Very we, successful brands in their own right. Yeah, exactly. So we have a way of, of uh, looking at that data. We call it potential, which is brands that are likely to actually gain share in the next year. MasterCard performs well there. Um, and because their meaningful difference against their competition, uh, competition has been increasing. So if I had to guess, if I was a betting man, which I'm not, um, oh, MasterCard... Go on, go on, go on. Let's, I think MasterCard let's, have your, let's have the money on the table, Martin. MasterCard is on the cusp of, um, of making that breakthrough. Maybe 2020 will be the year. Martin Guerrero, uh, Research Director, uh, Brandsy and Cantar, thanks very much indeed. Thanks, David. Thank you. Pick a card, any card. This is the new Brand Z card game, the Battle of the Brands. And as well as being a fun thing to play, it will also help you understand better some of the Brand Z core metrics and why they are so important. So if you want to have a play and you want to understand a little bit more about the Brand Z metrics, send me an email, david.roth at wpp.com, and I'll send you a pack of cards. Well, a very warm welcome back, Graham. Nice to see you again. Um, 
One of the lenses that's always interesting to look at the brands he dated through is those brands that have risen the fastest, um, because I suppose they all demonstrate some of the characteristics that we've been discussing in terms yep. of the trends, the changes. It's, it's, it's the hodgepodge, the melting pot uh, of all of those. When you look at the top 20, what do you see? Um, what we see is um, that complexity um, of the brandscape that now exists being reflected uh, in the brands that are growing. Um, the fastest risers um, uh, come from an astonishing array of different sectors. You've got Instagram on one side um, from you know, sort of massively growing uh, through uh, increasing the number of users that it's got and the attractiveness that it has for them through the features that it offers. Um, you've got uh, luxury brands like Dior and Yves Saint Laurent that are refreshing what they stand for, reaching a new generation and um, reminding people of the quality that they've always uh, And offered. that's quite interesting as much as because some of those brands are really new relatively yep. and some of those brands are really old. Really old. <laughs> Um, and yet it's about keeping themselves up to date, um, not necessarily changing what they do, not, not redefining what they stand for, but just telling people consistently about that. And I also think that maybe people think that actually the brands that are rising fastest are just the technology brands. Absolutely not. No, I mean, obviously with Instagram you have that, but a lot of the others here are, are brands that are doing something other than technology, but almost all of them are using technology in some clever way to help enable that uh, brand growth. So we see technology less as a category on its own now and more as an enabler of every brand. So that sort of balance between refreshing and innovating, uh, using technology in a way that uh, adds value uh, to the customer is becoming more and more vital, would you say? It is, it is. And on the right-hand side of this chart, we've got um, really interesting examples of brands that are innovating their offer, bringing new products, even entering new categories. Um, Uber, for example, uh, having uh, launched um, into, obviously, um, uh, ride hailing to start off with, uh, is now extending uh, both upwards into the air and even uh, in the last week, they've announced a scuba um, that you can hire off the barrier reef. So um, they're going underwater as well now. So um, is, there, is there no end um, I, <laughs> to, the way I, that, to, the, to the way that they can lose lots of money? Well, <laughs> um, it, I, I, I think you know, you're seeing uh, uh, the application of technology in all sorts of different ways. And again, ways that are, are going to surprise us and be very, very unpredictable. Who's going to be, be the next one to, to, to leverage a new tech? OK, let's uh, look at a couple of these in detail. Geico. OK. Geico, um, uh, a, a giant in the US insurance business. Um, but the interesting thing about it is that it's been doing the same thing fundamentally um, very consistently for the last 10 years and more. Um, so consistency is still the essence of a great brand? Consistency in terms of, yeah, what you mean to consumers. Um, really, really important. If you chop and change all the time uh, how you present yourself to, to your audience, um, you won't build up those mental patterns that help people to recognize you and, and instantly make that decision. Yes, I'll just renew my insurance with Geico. They're perfectly good company, and I'm really happy to be with them. Um, and that's what they've been able to do, keep reassuring, entertaining, and attracting people with consistent high-quality advertising, consistent media pressure, and that's resulted in consistent growth last year, up 29%. Not, not a bad showing up to a brand value of around $9 million, yeah? $9 billion dollars now. Um, and then uh, Japanese uh, uh, cosmetics brand. Yeah, I mean, we're jumping from one sector to something completely di di different. Um, interestingly, when we looked back at Sh Shiseido, uh, we saw that it had been in our rankings um, uh, back in the early uh, 2000s, but actually fell out. Which is why on that chart... Which is on this chart, the pink line shows the value. <laughs> it disappears. It, it's, it's, it, it goes beneath the surface, yeah. like the scuba. Um, 
However, um, some years ago, 2017, it came back into the ranking, and it's grown really fast since then. So it's innovated, it's addressed uh, the fundamentals of what people really want from uh, their cosmetics, and they've been able to improve both their meaning and their salience, so they've They've told people effectively what they're all about. So they've reached that audience again. Um, there's, I suppose, been uh, an amazing turnaround uh, for Lululemon over the course of the last three to four years. There has. And, uh, you know, we've got um, uh, uh, very few Canadian brands, but this is one of them in, in our ranking. This is part of the apparel uh, uh, top ten now. Actually, this year we'll be doing for the very first time uh, the top Canadian brands. Uh, and, and I'm sure, I'm sure it's going to feature <laughs> um, high up on the list. Incredibly successful export brand that started just as, as yoga pants. And you, know, um, you would not have thought that a yoga pant brand was going to take over the world. But then again, I'm sure when Levi Strauss invented the jeans for, for a cowboys back in the 1800s, the, was, they wouldn't have thought gold of what it was going to do. Anyway. Uh, for gold diggers, yes, yes, sorry, yes, the, uh, the prospectors, yeah. Um, and uh, what Lululemon have done is said, actually, what we make is great technical fabrics into great te technical clothing that's, that's good for anyone. And um, some of the experts we talked to um, uh, recently said, yeah, people are now wearing yoga pants to the office as part of smart business casual, you know, the casual business or smart casual wear uh, that's good for the office and enables you to nip off at lun lunchtime and have a quick stretch as well. In fact, part of the way of really generating a lot of insights from uh, the brand's evaluations that we do every single year is we get together the WPP experts across all of our uh, operating companies in the various different sectors that we look at to understand and get their perspective on uh, those trends, what's changed. And you can have a look at uh, those insights uh, from a lot of our WPP colleagues around the world by just downloading the report of uh, the brands you top 100 most valuable uh, global brands. And we'll be giving you the URL of how to uh, download that a little bit later on. Graham, two, three very interesting specifics. Um, when you look at the specifics, can you group them all together and say, OK, okay so what, what, is, what does that mean for us? Um, we can. And um, the uh, analysis that we've got here compares all the brands in the top 100 that are growing significantly uh, against brands that are flat um, or uh, are declining. And as I said at the beginning, we've got a lot of volatility, so there's plenty of both groups. Uh, that enables us to look at them in terms of these three fundamental pillars of how meaningful the brands are to people, how different they are from their competitors, and how salient or quickly and easily they come to mind. And what we can see is that the big discriminator between the growing group and the declining or flat group of brands is that they are more meaningful. They're significantly more meaningful to consumers, um, whereas um, the declining group are actually just as salient on average, in fact, a couple of points higher on the salience index. So salience alone isn't going to stop you. So salience, by that, we, in a sense, we mean awareness. It's awareness, more complicated, yeah, but, yeah. but in essence, it's awareness. Yeah, yeah. How, how, how quickly and easily, how richly they are embedded in someone's mind so they can come to mind quickly when you're making a brand choice. OK, so that's the, the first helicopter observation. What's the second? Well, you have to de delve into what does meaning mean. And uh, what we can see and what our diverse selection of examples showed is that meaning comes from many sources. Meaning is really just the richness, the breadth and depth of all those different mental associations that people have got uh, with brands. And that's not just what they know about them. It's what they feel about those brands as well. And when you have all of those associations in your mind, it helps you make faster, easier choices. People use these things called heuristics. Uh, that's the word that the psychologist coined um, to talk about a choice mechanism. And people simplify their lives by making the simplest choices they can. So they're just going to say, hmm, what do I need at the moment? Do I need something that's convenient, something that's good value, something that shows my status, something for a change, a novelty? 
And whatever your need might be, a brand has to have that association as close to the top of mind as it can in order to trigger that brand choice. Graham, once again, thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Prepare to meet our new and very smart chatbot. In my view, she's the most significant development for Brand Z since it was created. So please say hi to Rosie. Rose is very smart. She has DeepMind information about over 166,000 brands and thought leadership from experts right across Kantar and the entire WPP group. All served up instantly and with a smile. Put simply, Rosie will provide you, your teams and your clients with an even deeper knowledge and understanding of brands the world over, empowering every single WPP colleague and turbocharging new business success. We all agree that data is king, but data can be dry and hard to navigate. It's only useful when it tells an actionable story and when it's easy to find what you want fast. That's why I enlisted Rosie. She's born of AI, but thanks to machine learning and brilliant programming, she's intuitive, imaginative, and oozes personality. She never stops learning and is always ready to pass on the next relevant nugget of information about any given brand. And what's appealing for you is that she can break down all that brand understanding into bite-sized chunks for you to access. Need a SWOT on your brand or one of its competitors? It will be on your screen and in your inbox in less than a minute. The same for brand values, be they global, local, current and over time. Brand genomes, brand characters and their personalities, vitality quotients, trends, and of course, a fund of brand studies, reports, and thought leadership from experts right across the WPP network. Back in the day, when I was global planning director on major blue chip business, if only I had Rosie to help me. My knowledge and understanding of brands around the world would have been fuller. My briefs would have been smarter. My answers to clients quicker. And my new business record even rosier. But don't take my word for it. Go to the link and start working with Rosie yourself. Well, Martin, thanks for joining us again. Um, a number of themes that we've discussed, uh, a large number of themes that uh, is best sort of picked off because we haven't got enough time to do it here for everybody to download the report and uh, read some of the cross-category trends and read some of the key takeouts and insights. But sure. um, just a couple of key thoughts from you in terms of wrapping this up. Uh, what are some big thoughts? Yeah, so some things to think about. So I think um, there's clearly been a push in the world at large and for brands and marketeers generally to think more about social responsibility, corporate responsibility is a very hot topic. Um, and there's been this term thrown around in the industry of woke washing, which is almost paying lip service to some of those themes without necessarily um, believing them or then fitting very well with a particular brand. Um, we have seen some large brands make strides in terms of perceptions in those areas in the last few years. So Nike, Shell, Coke and McDonald's on this particular slide. Um, so I think from our perspective, it's about making sure that if your brand is going to talk about those topics, making sure that it does it in a sensitive way, but also a way that fits with your core brand values. Otherwise, there'll be no payoff. In fact, it could have a negative impact on your brand. Now, when you look at the top 10, you probably don't see this. When you look at the, you know, sort of the 100 to 90, you start to see this. But the impact that the disruptors having in the market. Yeah, so again, we talk about disruption a lot and the industry at large does. And I think the way we think about disruption is um, almost a, a simple framework and a way to think about it is 
the way in which a particular brand or offer impacts a category or a market. Um, and there's almost a, a sliding scale of what a disruptive impact could be. So at one end of the spectrum, um, it's almost redistribution of existing value within a category. Um, somewhere in the middle, it would be adding value to an existing category, which I think is um, typically what would happen. And then in exceptional circumstances, a much larger impact is where a brand or an offer comes along and actually adds value and creates value and creates an entirely new category altogether. Um, let's um, have a look at what I suppose what the challenge then is for uh, brand owners, for marketeers in that disruption world. Because yeah. it's, it's pretty easy to be disrupted, but actually you need to do it in a way that impacts consumers and means something to consumers. Yeah, exactly. Being disruptive, but being focused in the way you disrupt is really important. And actually, we've proven with our data for the first time this year that actually those brands that are meaningfully disruptive are the brands that see the payoff. And we've developed a really simple framework um, in terms of how to keep close to changing consumer expectations. And I think we overcomplicate disruption. All we mean really by meaningful disruption is staying close to evolving consumer needs and evolving a brand's offer accordingly. Um, and the four ways we've come up with for brands to do that, and we'll talk through some examples in a second. One is by having a genuinely original product or service. The second is by having a radically new business model to give you an advantage against some of the existing players. The third area is renewal of either core purpose or target consumer and adding value to your brand and growing in that way. And the fourth, um, and we've seen some good examples of that this year in particular, is really using tech to diversify and scale um, and achieve huge volume very, very quickly. But I suppose the challenge of doing all of those, all those things or whatever subset you want, you think are most important to you, but now having to do that at speed as well. Yes, I mean, that's, that's the challenge. And as we said, you know, tech is a hygiene factor, but increasingly the need for speed, if you like, is, um, is certainly there as well. But do that and you drive your brand value. Yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. So some examples of each of those four areas. So one, um, an original product or service. One of our fastest risers this year, Netflix, is a good example. But if you think of automotive, the world of transport, Tesla obviously fits into that territory as well. Um, in terms of a radical new business model, a brand like Geo, the Indian um, comms provider, not yet in the top 100, but has gone from strength to strength in the last few years by essentially offering free data um, as their first uh, entry into the market, which clearly attracted huge volumes of consumers. And then by introducing a small charge, it was a brand that made a lot of revenue very quickly um, and changed the rules for data provision in India generally. So that to me is true disruption um, when you can actually disrupt for the benefit of all, um, let alone you know, your own customers. Um, and then in terms of renewal of purpose or target, Gucci is a good example. It's definitely gone after and targeted Asian millennials with its range of um, Chinese New Year clothing. Um, and Lululemon is another good example. So again, not a top 100 brand, but has made strides in our apparel list by really taking the principles of yoga and applying them not just to those who do yoga, but to a broader set of athleisure at a premium price. Um, and then on the tech front, in terms of achieving volume quickly, two good examples from our um, newcomers. Didi Chuk Singh in China, and Meituan, which thinks of itself as the Amazon of services. Um, online to offline is relevant. Understanding of data is relevant. Using AI um, to draw meaning from that data and ultimately follow consumer needs. Brilliant examples of that. And all of those brands are not just disrupting, but disrupting in a meaningful way and growing as a result. Now, you mentioned some of the uh, categories, of course. Um, in addition to the top 100 most valuable global brands, we also have the category rankings, um, and all those category rankings are available to be looked at and worked through and understood uh, through the uh, report, again, which you can uh, download. And I'll be giving you details about how to do that a little bit later on. Martin, always a pleasure. Thank you very much indeed. And if you can thank, thank you. Uh, your team, who've done a spectacular job, as always, in uh, making sure that we have Brandy data uh, to uh, evaluate across all of the various different ways we do, not just uh, evaluation data, but also the brand analytic data, um, which powers uh, our new analytics tools. Absolutely. Uh, thanks very much, Dean. And in no particular, uh, to Judith, who doesn't usually <laughs> get a great deal of airtime, but frankly, without her, we wouldn't have any data at all. So if you can Absolutely. thank the team when you get back. Martin Guerrera, uh, the head of and Director of Research for Brandsy and Cantar. Thank you very much indeed. Thanks, David. See you next year. Well, as we said, one of the key new entrants in the Brandsy Top 100 Most Valuable Global Brands for 2019 is Haya. And I was fortunate enough to go to Qingdao in China, 
where Haya are headquartered to speak to the president and CEO of the Haya group, Mr. Joe. Well, first of all, thank you very much indeed uh, for uh, being with us. Uh, it's a great pleasure and a, and a privilege to be able to speak to you. Um, before we start talking about some of, uh, some of the detail, I think it would be useful if you could just uh, explain a little bit about uh, the history of Haya and how Haya started and how they've got to where they are today. I'm very delighted to have this chance, to have this uh, meeting with you. So the company of Hire was uh, founded back in 1984. Uh, its predecessor uh, was a very small-scale uh, home appliance factory in the city of Qingdao. Uh, our founder, Mr. Zhang Rimin himself, uh, came to the company in the year of 1984 and then he introduced the technology from the German company of uh, Lieberherr and that basically started our journey of entrepreneurship and the uh, development of, of the company. So as you can uh, calculate, it has been 35 years since Hire was founded back in 1984. So previously we were solely a refrigerator manufacturer. And then since 1991 we started making other appliances including washing machine, uh, water heater, air conditioner, even TV, uh, covering all different areas of the appliance business. Uh, and in that process uh, we tried to replicate our model and our culture by uh, acquiring uh, many uh, different business uh, in the sector so as to become a diversified and comprehensive uh, appliance manufacturer and, and that, that way uh, we uh, end up becoming the number one appliance uh, maker uh, in the country. Mm -hmm. So the uh, fifth stage uh, started from 2012 to, to this very day. Uh, when we categorize this stage as the uh, network strategy phase, uh, by which we mean that in this uh, digital era, especially in the upcoming IoT era, which is, we believe is around the corner, uh, all organizations, including our own, should become a network-based uh, organization. And the way we do it is to disrupt the traditional uh, structure of big business organization. Instead, uh, we have transformed our organization into uh, lots of micro-enterprises uh, so that it is is directly connected with the market, with the user. Uh, and we believe that each corporation or company is just a node of a bit network in the world. And that way, we believe, is the best way for us to adapt to the challenges of the IoT era. Now, you were one of the very first Chinese companies to recognize the importance of the brand. What was it that you saw in the brand that you realized was immensely important? Well, I, I believe brand is uh, vital, is extremely important for any company. Uh, in fact, uh, you know, it's not the fact that uh, many companies uh, will consider branding when they become big. That's not the right logic. Instead, I think only when the company has this branding strategy can they become a big and powerful company. Uh, so when it comes to branding, I believe uh, it's not just in the hearts of the consumers, it's also in the hands of uh, your employees, right? Uh, so the value of your brand uh, does not only depend on the consumer reviews, uh, it also depends on the actual behavior of your employees. Uh, and branding is the uh, lifeblood for any business. Now, you've successfully operated uh, your business in the phases that you've explained, I suppose up till very recently this last phase, um, with a traditional business model. So, you know, a centralised head office, uh, senior management team setting strategic directions and managing the business. You've now created a very different uh, platform, um, sort of a pioneering new model for uh, a new age, as you say, the Internet of Things age. Can you explain why you think it's necessary to change the business model for the IoT age? Why? 
Uh, yes, I think the reason is that uh, in this uh, well, currently internet age and upcoming IoT era, uh, the demand from the consumers or from users have been evolving all the time. Uh, they're changing and they become increasingly more personalized, individualized. Therefore, it's becoming uh, increasingly more difficult, challenging for any business to satisfy those individualized uh, demands. Uh, therefore, we have to transform of our organization to adapt to those uh, new demands from the users, to making sure that our every employee of us can be connected directly to the market, to the users, to respond to users' uh, evolving and the fast changing needs uh, uh, all the time so that we can iterate our product and service to satisfy those needs. On the other hand, uh, when our company uh, is getting bigger and bigger, inevitably uh, we might suffer from the typical disease of big business when we have a lot of bureaucracy. Uh, therefore, we need to transform our organization into many different micro enterprises so that we have the agility of the small business. But when we have so many micro enterprises, uh, how can we maintain that all enterprises can move in the similar direction. That's why we have this platform, uh, which can, uh, on the one hand, has this still the skill of economy. On the other hand, uh, it can coordinate among different enterprises, micro enterprises, so that uh, all these ME can move forward in you know, similar direction. That is why we have this Ren Dan He Yi model, which plays this role of uh, coordinating among different uh, micro enterprises uh, to move forward. So that way, on one hand, we do have the uh, benefit of the agility of small business. On the other hand, we have the you know big scale of economy of a big business. That is our platform, and that's how we uh, making these changes. You said that uh, Haya started um, with refrigerators and then to washing machines. Um, there's been a great transition over the years, um, which is immensely impressive. What business would you now say Hire is in? I think uh, Hire currently is no longer a home appliance manufacturer. Uh, we rather say we are a solution provider of uh, a smart home solution. We provide a smart home solution. Uh, we don't just uh, provide hardwares, rather we provide lifestyles, we provide solutions. We hope that uh, we can uh, continue providing such uh, solution for better life or more beautiful life for consumers across the whole globe. Well, um, Mr. Chair, thank you very much indeed for joining me. It's been an absolute pleasure talking to you. Thank you very much indeed. Well, thank you so much. I'm very privileged to have this conversation with you. I hope you can keep uh, watching higher and to provide your support higher, and you're welcome to visit higher anytime you want. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs>um, certainly in China in terms of brands coming in and brands coming out. That's true, yes. Um, in Asia overall, and we see the, 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 the fluid, the volatility is mainly in, in, in Asia. And uh, this year we have two Indian brands, and HDFC, the number one bank, and the Tata Consulting Group, uh, which is a very impressive um, uh, B2B brand. Plus also an Indonesian brand, must yes, have been that. Yes, yes, and one Indonesian brand is the BCA, is uh, the bank who is very dedicated to lower tier markets and to the youth uh, accessibility to financials and also very, very strong on online banking. Um, in terms of the sector, was a good indicator. Um, we haven't seen growth in every single sector, but we've seen some spectacular growth. Yeah, spectacular growth on luxury, retail, and insurance. And uh, luxury, uh, and the, these three categories actually have one thing in common, and they are both, they are all very much focused on experience uh, and, and providing are we, are great experience. Are we seeing experience. experience becoming more and more important to the um, velocity of how fast brands can grow their brand value? 
Yes, indeed. Uh, actually, brand experience is, is one of the key drivers and for future brand value growth. And we have seen that those brands which are perceived high on delivering great experience are able to achieve brand value growth, which is two times faster than the average brands. And these three categories have all deliver great experience and online offline integration and also insurance and luxury they use great uh, communication to let consumers anticipate amazing experience and so that communication and experience are haloing impacting each other and, and the importance of amplifying that in terms of what the communication uh, is all about let's let's take a look at uh, retail door in a sector that's very dear to my heart what are we yeah. seeing there Retail over the past year has achieved a 25% value growth, which is very impressive. It's mainly driven by salience. And what does that mean? It's not just a physical store, but it's also online and the O2O, online, offline, fully integrated services. And Alibaba, for example, the two-hour Hema delivery and the together with um, its Ulema and the other platform actually help uh, the the, the e-commerce giant to really increase its salience significantly. Well, it seems now that uh, China retail is uh, leading the world in uh, in retail. Um, even uh, Alibaba now, in terms of their delivery, is moving from a two-hour, one-hour slot to a thirty a thirty-minute slot. Um, we were at the uh, World Retail Congress a few weeks ago uh, in Amsterdam, where we launched the Brandsy Top 75 Most Valuable. Uh, global retail brands, um, and that's the place where the C-suite of uh, global retailers uh, meet. Pretty much everyone was talking about China retail. Last year, many people didn't even mention China mm. at all. Why do you think people now are focusing on understanding and wanting to know more about what's going on in China retail? Well, I definitely agree that when we talk about retail innovation, China is definitely the place and to look at. Uh, there are two reasons. Number one is mobile and AI. And the leveraging AI and, and the mobile penetration and, and, and all the data accessibility and also data analysis and enable uh, uh, expediting um, growth of retail in China. Second is a payment system. And China moved directly from cash all the way to mobile payment. And that gave uh, retail a huge, huge opportunity um, to keep growing and to exp expediting and online offline integration is another reason. And we need to look closer and on China is not, it's, right now it's not just the online platform, but the offline platform is supplementing and make sure it's online to offline, offline to online. It's, um, it's, it's a, it's a, a complete, complete circle. Virtuous, it's a complete circle. circle. You know, I would say to anybody listening that if you really want to understand where the future is in terms of the integration between online and offline, you absolutely need to go to China and see what's going on. Yeah, we should do our innovation tour. We should do. Yeah. It's a deal, let's do it. Yes. <laughs> So, Dorian, uh, thank you very much indeed. Um, as we said, um, the World Retail Congress was in Amsterdam this year, just a few weeks ago, and that was the place where we launched the Brand Z Top 75 Most Valuable Global Retail Brands. And I also got an opportunity during the course of the Congress to speak with a number of the global retail leaders to understand what was on their mind and what some of the key implications were going forward for retailing over the course of the next couple of years. I also got the opportunity to speak with the Prime Minister of the Netherlands. Let's have a little snippet of what some of them said.
I still go to physical stores, of touch you do. things, pick them up, Listen, enjoy the curation. I love the idea, if I can't do something uh, and I've got a bit short of time, that I can sit on my mobile phone and order, you know, my groceries from Ricardo on my mobile phone tonight and get them delivered by 7 o'clock tomorrow morning. When you ran uh, Marks and Spencers, uh, just as an example of the many businesses that you've run, how did you manage to take your um, vision, your perspective, and make the person on the shop floor, the person who's interacting with the consumer, understand that? Well, it is, uh, you know, it is difficult, number one, but the, the answer is have a very simple story. Number two, believe the story. Number three, articulate the story and get people to buy into it. And number four, keep repeating it, repeating it, repeating it, repeating it. Actually, I've just used a couple of words. But for me, you know, it was quality, value, service, innovation and trust. It's always surprised me, as an ex-retailer myself, that uh, governments around the world have underestimated the contribution that retailing makes to the economy and to the society. It's a scandal. Your views? It's a scandal. I mean, uh, being, 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 being realistic, uh, governments owe us around the world a great debt of gratitude because retailers are remarkably efficient, they're remarkably innovative, they're ingenious at being able to deal with difficulties and, you know, wherever they are, whether it's currencies going up or down, whether it's issues on supply chains and whatever else. And if you look at the cost of electronics and clothing and food in real terms over the last 50 years, they've gone down. When, when you first started, was it 20, 20 years ago? Just, just, just under. Just under 20 years ago, yeah. so let's be kind, 19 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and the ups and downs you've had. At any point did you say, actually, it was, a, it was a great idea, but we're going to give up. Well, we wouldn't be here if I'd ever said <laughs> that. There were plenty of people who suggested yes, that we should yes, say yes. that. Well, that's who says. Um, what little well, they know. We, we, we ignored them and, uh, you know, carried on. Um, but I think for many years, a lot of people thought e-commerce was going to be a very small part of the market, that it was best to do it from your existing store-based yes. assets. And the idea of automation, centralization, of building all this soft software was completely redundant. And slowly but surely, we won people over. As, as Rodney would say, we did the best job for our customers in their homes. We delivered a, a better and more outstanding service than the, the giants of our market, the Tesco's and the Sainsbury's and the Asda's and people. And so we started to grow and we grew and we grew and we started to show that we could do it at economics that none of them could do. And that was the really weird part where we could do the best service and the best economics. Over that learning period, what, what are the key sort of pillars of things that have helped you take sort of a leap um, in both your offer and your proposition Look, it's over interesting. that time. People are always thinking there's like a silver bullet or there's one part of our proposition that we did better. And visibly, they often look at the warehouse and go, it's the Ocado warehouse. And actually, the thing that's allowed us to succeed to where we are today and allowed us to have something that can help the likes of a business such as Kroger is that what we're actually good at is innovating. And what we're actually good at is driving ourselves forward all the time. It seems now in China that unless you're delivering within 30 minutes, you're not really in the game. Are we going to see delivery speed being the driver of the growth of e-commerce and the differentiator? Or is at some point that's actually just going to, going to stop? <laughs> I think, as Rodney mentioned on stage before, we've been trying a service called Zoom in West London at the moment, and our average uh, delivery time from placing the order is 30 minutes. Um, but I see that more as a convenience offering that will serve a customer's grocery needs, probably not competing with the main shop that they do with us anyway, competing with a store they might have propped into, but also competing with you know, a, 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 a restaurant delivery service or a restaurant itself. Um, and it's early days for us, but we're seeing, you know, double digit week on week growth there in sales. How do you, as the chairman and the CEO, decide on the priorities of things that are, wow, that's really going to have a great impact. That's a fantastic idea, but actually we shouldn't be devoting any resource to it. I mean, it, it really does start with the customer and understanding customer trends. So an example would be several years ago with our own brands, we introduced a line called Simple Truth and it's a natural and organic brand. Uh, today, it's a $2.3 billion brand, and we introduced it five years ago. Artificial intelligence, um, it's impossible to read an article anywhere on anything without artificial intelligence being there. Um, are you harnessing the power of that within the massive data sets that you now have at Kroger? Uh, I, I, the, um, I would say yes and no. Um, 
<laughs> if you look, compare it to five years ago, the answer is yes. But if you look at versus the potential, it's, I think we're just beginning that journey. And it's the exciting part of the journey. How would you characterize, maybe in one or two words, or maybe even a sentence, the, the age we're living today? When you, when you leave your home and you go into the office, what do you feel? Energized and excited. Fantastic. I think that's, uh, that pretty much sums it up, yeah. <laughs> it's rapid, you know, it's rapid change, but it's opportunity. The, the context of, of the company, but also as, as the context of the company's communication. Coca-Cola is obviously a, a mass communicator on many, many different levels right across the world. Do you think companies like Coke have also a responsibility within their communications to show a diverse approach? Uh, absolutely, and I think... Um, I think that's an area where I'm really proud of what we've done, you know, and not just in the past few years, but forever. And, and if you ever have an interest in, in looking into this, there's um, some really interesting stories that are on our webpage. But years ago, um, in the American South, when it was not per really permissible to show people of color and uh, Caucasian people sitting together, things like that, that was quite risky in the 60s. There's a famous um, uh, billboard print, uh, print ad uh, where there is um, an African-American person and a Caucasian person that are sitting on a bench together and they're physically touching. And the bench also has a little separation of the arm in there. So even some of the nuances in the artwork um, showed our point of view um, because we have always been an inclusive brand. You know, the famous Andy Warhol um, statement around Elizabeth Taylor, the queen, and the, and the bum on the street, they all get the same Coke. So I think that we've certainly had that part of our DNA, DNA really before we talked about it. In fact, there was a moment of time where we were trying to figure out how to talk about it with the right tone of, of humility. But I, I do think brands can really play a role in uh, those conversations. And to Sinead's point, I think people who are considering uh, employment are looking for that sort of conscious with companies. So finally, what advice or help, probably that's a better word for it, what um, help do you think companies uh, should, should, should do on the, on the glide path to increasing their diversity within the organization? What advice would you give them? I think it has to start with both education and research. So exactly as you were saying, having an understanding of where the company currently exists is the only way in which you can design a path for it to see where it is you need or want to be. Thank you very much indeed for talking to Good us. Good to be here. It was a fascinating uh, discussion that you've just had. Thank We're you. all amazingly impressed that you do your own grocery shopping. What, <laughs> why is that? <laughs> well, because I, I have to eat, and otherwise I would die from hunger, and uh, nobody else wants to do it. Well, that's a very good motivation. <laughs> uh, it's also great fun. I mean, uh, there is a nice shop around the corner, so uh, nice people there. Um, Mr. Prime Minister, what um, contribution do you think that retailing makes to the economy and society in general? So many. I mean, it is the biggest employer in the Netherlands. Uh, 900,000 people are somehow connected to the retail sector, so it is huge in its economic impact. That means that many people, in many cases young people, start their working life experiences in the retail sector. It is also a place where you can learn how to be more entrepreneurial and how to start your own business. Uh, it is a sector in our economy which is very much focused on innovation and disruptive innovation. It is very much connected to uh, the modern economy, to the internet, to online shopping. So there are so many positives. And it's also a place where people come together. Uh, it's also a sort of uh, community place. Eh? In some of the stores people drink a cup of coffee, uh, meet friends and then buy some stuff. So it has many, many impacts on society. Mr. Prime Minister, you had a fantastic career at Unilever. You obviously know brands very well. Do you think country brands are as important as product brands? Oh, they're crucial. And what I found in this job is that the brand of Amsterdam, the brand of the Netherlands, the brand of Eindhoven, or the, uh, the whole um, uh, commercial uh, area around uh, cities like Zwolle and Amersfoort are, are crucial for our international standing. And the fact that you can bike to school as a child, that uh, it's relatively safe here, that there are so many possibilities when you like sports or culture. And I really learned to, to brand that much more than we did already. One last question, Mr. Prime Minister. What, what advice would you give uh, retailers today who are under a, a lot of pressure, under a lot of stress? Uh, everything's changing very fast. 
Yeah, but still, at the same time, you are in a fascinating sector. Uh, so enjoy what you are doing. We live only once. This is the f this is the real thing. Uh, this is not the uh, um, uh, so, so so you have to make the best of it. I very much hope that you'll visit that URL and uh, watch the interviews in full. I think you'll find them very useful and very helpful because everybody who participated, and thank you very much for doing so, were very generous with their insights. Well, as the Prime Minister of the Netherlands said, country brands and country branding is becoming more and more important. At WPP, we have a best country study done in conjunction with BAV, VML, YNR, US News and Wharton Business School. And you can take a look at the 2019 Best Countries study at this URL here. Well, we've covered a lot of ground, Graham. Nice to have you back. Um, let's summarise some of the implications of all the various different things that we've been discussing it today. Uh, yeah, and I think the first and the biggest one of those is that just understand it's a, an uncertain and ambiguous and complex world out there. What the marketer needs is the best possible information as up-to-date as possible so that you can actually make reasonable assumptions about what might be happening next and act upon them. The next point is around disruption. As my colleague Mark Martin was saying, um, disruption is going to happen in every category. We see it now across the board. So look for what you can do to disrupt before somebody comes so, along yeah, get, and disrupts you. So get your you. retaliation in first. Absolutely. Um, it's, it, you know, you might just get away for some time with being the best at what you do at the moment, but it won't last for much longer. We talked a lot about ecosystems. What's the take out of that? Well, obviously not every brand can be an ecosystem. So either you've got to um, find a way that you can insert yourself into the businesses that other brands are doing, um, or make yourself indispensable to them. So you are trying to make sure that your brand uh, fits in as seamlessly, as frictionlessly, as we like, like to say, with the consumer experience, even if that means giving up some of the control to work in partnership with other brands. We talk a lot about boundary-less. <laughs> yes, and uh, you know, how impossible it is to almost define a category. And actually, you know, it's quite a liberating thought. Let's throw away uh, the boundaries, um, uh, a, a leading marketing thinker says you shouldn't actually consider yourself to ever have more than 3% of, of, of the possible business that you could be doing. Um, so keep redefining your boundaries until actually you can see much more opportunity than threat out there. It's a much more difficult thing to do than it sounds, isn't it? It is. Because I think we're all comfortable in the sectors that we work in or the categories that we operate in. Or That's right. But, you know, I mean... Uh, these days, if you're uh, even something as simple as a chocolate bar, you don't know if you're uh, competing with a fermented milk energy drink uh, or an apple. So, you know, people have so many choices. And fundamentally now, experience, experience, experience. Experience is um, what is going to drive growth in future. Adding value, adding some relevance and some meaning to that consumer experience, the point at which they're actually consuming, using... Um, experiencing your brand, that's the critical differentiating factor. Well, Graham, thanks very much indeed. It's difficult to sum uh, all of the insights that, uh, that we have uh, managed to glean out of the data. Clearly, lots more in the report. I hope everybody uh, downloads it and has a good read. Thank you very much indeed. Um, scary to say. Um, we all look forward to the analysis and the data for my goodness gracious me, 2020, would you believe that? Yeah. And, yeah, our 15th year of Brand Z. Graham, thank you very much indeed. Thank you, David. Well, time really has flown, and we're almost at the end of the Brand Z Top 100 Most Valuable Global Brands Web Seminar for 2019. All the material that you've seen today will be available for you to download as 
will the full report, which gives not just the rankings, but the analysis and insight and opinion pieces from many of our WPP experts from right across the world. And all you need to do is go to the new Brandy website in order to download that. At the end of this web seminar, I'll also be sending you an email that has the links to all the various different assets that uh, you can use uh, with your clients, with your colleagues, and on your social network platforms. I just want to say thank you very much to all of our guests who've appeared on today's program, uh, to Igor, who's produced it, to Studio Stream, who've uh, recorded it and made sure that all the technicals work. From me, David Roth at WPP, thank you very much indeed for watching and congratulations to every single brand in this year's Top 100 Most Valuable Global Brands 2019. Have a great rest of the day and thank you very much indeed for watching.